Salem Methodist Church in our service this very brisk fall morning but I hear the weather's going to get back up in the 80s so you won't have to wear a jacket too long and then watch out yeah uh, I would call your attention to the prayer requests in the bulletin we've had several this week uh, Dr. Paul Rudin passing, and Elaine Rudin uh, has been coming to our church here for about, uh, I'd say about two years. Paul was coming when he was healthy and well to come, but he hasn't been able to, he wasn't able to be here for probably about the last uh, six, eight months, I think he was probably not able to come, so uh, <clears throat> keep uh, Elaine and her family in your prayers. Jim Miller, we talked about that last week in his passing. Uh, the Pauley family, Ben's brother-in-law, who was ill, uh, passed away. And Janice King with a broken vertebrae following a fall, and she's uh, Donna's niece. So those people, and then Loretta Bowser having heart surgery, who's a friend of Linda Wyman's, Wayman's, Marvin Starkey, Unable to use his legs, scheduled for back. He's still scheduled for back surgery. Had it? Okay. Okay. And Al Meissen's future son in law, Anthony, Anthony, who's been diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. So 
There's a lot of people that needed a lot of prayers. So uh, that's all I have in that respect. You may have more to add when I come out. Uh, <clears throat> upcoming events. Uh, this was in the mail back there. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with it, but it's a community event sponsored by the Lola Real Estate, Loya Real Estate Group. It's a carnival. Saturday the 14th, next Saturday, by the pool parking lot. I'm assuming that's a public pool somewhere here, but I have no idea where the pool is. Does anybody re remember this or familiar with this? Anyway, if you're interested, it's fun for all kinds of people, a lot of fun for kids and ice cream and food and <coughs> sounds like a place I ought to stay away from. But uh, it's a community event brought to you by the Yoya Group Real Estate Group. Uh, other upcoming events, noodle making is still an ongoing process that's going to culminate when we have our chicken noodle dinner in October. Uh, stewardship pillar will be meeting Tuesday night at 630 and then next week is the church council meeting. You can see the rest of the, uh, the events that are coming up here. So I'll come out and see if you've got anything to add and break the uh, the attendance sheets here. Did I turn that on, John? Did, did I turn that on? Is there a green light on it? That might help me. Huh? Sorry. I forgot. I got it. It's, it's, there it is. Okay. Let's go over here. Anybody got anything over here in the... Ice cream social. This was left. And it's been here since then. So if anybody knows who this belongs to, let us get it. Or we'll put it in the rummage sale. So, there you go. Okay. How about here? Good morning, I'm Al, and I just want to make a slight correction to what John had mentioned and what's in the bulletin. It, Anthony's uncle, not his father, uh, who has got the cancer, so I did want to let everybody know the correct person. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Anyone else here? Donna? Uh, good news about uh, Janice King, um, when they said that she had broken the vertebrae, uh, that was through the emergency uh, room for an x-ray. But uh, since then she went to a specialist and they did an MRI and there doesn't appear to be anything broken. Maybe it just awoke up a massive um, arthritis. So. That's prayers for that. And um, noodle making, 9 o'clock this Tuesday. Hello, my name is Star Starkey, and Marshall and I are both co chairs of the chicken noodle dinner. And we've almost got our noodles done. Yes. And. Um, um, I'm going to go ahead and start sending around a clipboard just because we're not going to be here next week and it'll be here before I know it. So we're just going to do it early. Thank you. Good to see you back, Mary. Uh, it's good to be back, but um, I hope Wednesday I go to the doctor and I hope I can get out of this thing that I'm in, but maybe not. I'm trying to be as patient as I can be. But uh, the reason I really, I appreciate everybody that has so far given me donations for Alzheimer's, uh, but it's like the end of the month, so anybody that would like to give donations, I'd greatly appreciate it. Anyone else here? Paul. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share with you that um, I put a program from Reverend Miller's funeral yesterday on the vestibule. If any of you 
would like to look at it um, or just smile at his picture. <laughs> it was a lovely service. Um, several people from Salem attended. Um, and as you're reading the bulletin, make sure that you note that we have confirmed entertainment for our fall event across the street, formerly known as Camp Out with Christ. Um, and Stones Crossing, the family gospel group, is going to come and sing for us. So bring your friends and come and listen to music and enjoy some food and fellowship with us. Since Paul is done, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a couple of quick comments. Um, she mentioned the Camp Out for Christ. Uh, that is across the street. In the evening, we do a campfire, hayride, sing. We have food. Um, so that's right, Haven. Yes. <laughs> so um, we'll roast marshmallows. I'll try not to burn the place down like it started last year. Um, so uh, it's a lot of fun. It's open to everybody, every age. And we don't necessarily camp out anymore, but if it's a nice night, there could be a tent or two put up. And so we're not gonna discourage that. So um, next item is walnuts. Um, with the Samaritan's Purse, the uh, Christmas Child program that Deneen is running. She's not here today, Ruth's bowling up in Chicago. Um, We've got two of our uh, totes down here. If you've got walnuts at home and you throw them away, please consider bringing them up here and uh, putting in our totes. And we may get a roll off dumpster and put out in the parking lot that'll help cut some of the handling down. We're in the process of talking about or working on that. Um, Violet's son has some of those and uh, he's made it available. So uh, we're gonna try and work that out. Um, but we take the money when we go turn those in, we take that money to help pay for the postage, the shipping on the, the boxes and the extra Bible study. Um, and in the last oh, five years or plus, um, it's always worked out real well. So if you, your neighbors, uh, if you've got walnuts, don't just sweep them up and throw them in a creek, um, bring them in here and. It'll, it'll help us with our project. Um, so, and again, Tina's on vacation today uh, and next week. So we normally don't have the TV up here, but that's the best way to have Tina with us uh, is Memorex. So thank you. I think from last year and more people coming and bringing walnuts, we're about to become the walnut capital of Zinesville. <laughs> but that's a good thing. So we'll now go into our service, and if you would turn to page 657, the song of preparation is, This is the Day.
Good morning. Would everyone please stand and join me in the call to worship? Our call to worship this morning is Psalms 12, or excuse me, 124 on page 846, verses 1 through 8. If it had not been the Lord who, on, who was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when the foes rose up against us, then it would have called us to us. Then it would have called us to Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our hymn of adoration will be Where He Leadeth Me on page 338. If you will now turn to page 881 and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. from Proverbs and the New Inter International Bible. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity, and the rod they wield in fury will be broken. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in the court. For the Lord will take up their case and will accept life for life. That's Let us join together in a time of prayer as we go before the Lord in our prayer time. Precious Lord Jesus, we thank you for extending our days on earth through your grace. We thank you, Father, that we have been allowed to return to this sanctuary in this place where we meet together for worship. We meet together to study and for fellowship with you and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we accept your invitation to approach your throne boldly and by your invitation and by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Father, we've deserved your wrath, but we thank you that in your mercy and your love you have instead extended to us your grace and forgiveness of our sins. We freely acknowledge that you are God and we're not. And we acknowledge that only Jesus saves us and forgives us of our sins. And we acknowledge that Christ is our life. Help us, Father, who claim to be Christians, to take our call to be living sacrifices seriously. Help us to devote ourselves as never before to your divine wisdom and to the spreading of the gospel message the truth that is seasoned with love and gentleness. Father, we believe that you have created each one of us for such a time as now. So use us as you will to bring about your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Please continue to show your mercy on us. Father, we continue to pray earnestly for your comfort and your guidance to those who have recently lost loved ones. And Father, we, we pray for friends and loved ones that the last enemy to be destroyed, which is death, will be conquered. Be with those also, Father, dealing with injuries and illnesses. We pray for healings and for strength to endure. May you be glorified, Father, even even through our illnesses and our injuries, may you have the glory. Father, we thank you for hearing the requests of our broken hearts. 
both those made public and those spoken silently only to you. We trust you are in control and we lift these concerns to you, the only one who can really help us. Please continue, Father, to hear us as we join our hearts and our voices to pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> As we come to this offering time, I have a question for you. How, how would you like to live in a community where there is absolutely no church? No, no religious thinking at all. Is that me or is that you? <laughs> Don't you just love modern equipment? <laughs> how, how would you like to live in a community with no, no church, no religious emphasis whatsoever? You know, you know, we've always thought that in America we're always going to have three uh, consonants. We've always thought we're going to have the home, the school, and the church. Uh, it, it was never, shall we have homes, only... What kind of homes will we have? It was never, shall we have schools? What kind of schools will we have? It was never, shall we have churches? What, just what kind of churches will we have? But the question now kind of seems to be, are these things really going to continue to exist in America? We're not so sure that they're always going to be. Dr. Charles E. Brown tells the story of a man who wanted to establish a community without any church, absolutely forbid any kind of religious activity at all. He bought a thousand acres of tract in one of the most desirable spots in that section of the country. And then he laid out a town with all of the conveniences, anything you could dream was in that town. Uh, hospitals, schools, even places of entertainment, everything you could want for. And then he established playgrounds and places of recreation. He created beautiful homes that were affordable on the proverbial American easy payment plan. And he, est he established industry with all the profits that come with that. But in every deed to every piece of property, there was this clause that this property could never be used for religious purposes. Well, in the course of a few years, that, that experiment had grown to a population of about 5,000 people. Uh, oh, it, it was difficult. There were difficulties. It was difficult to get decent women to come. It was difficult to get decent school teachers because most people wanted at, the, at least the atmosphere of the church, if not the church itself. They found difficulty in getting parents with small children to come. They wanted to grow up in at least a Christian atmosphere. It was difficult to get the kind of school teachers, too. It, it was just really kind of strange. And then, after a few years, as Dr. Brown tells the story, after a few years, a strange thing happened. After about five years, the entire enterprise began to fall apart at the seams. It just began to collapse. And at last, fearing that he was going to lose in his investment and have to take out bankruptcy, he published in the newspaper the following quotation. To whom it may concern, God knows that there is no God. My motto has always been to hell with religion. But for some fool reason that no man can fathom, 
I have found by experience that we cannot do business in this country on any other basis than that silly bit of sentiment that we print on our coins in God we trust. Therefore, I've infernal foolishness though it all is, I've sent for a preacher, we're going to have a church. That man ran headlong into the thing that every community in America, I think, has to come to grips to get with. There are going to be churches, we know that, but what kind of churches? What kind of churches will there be? There are going to be schools, but what kind of schools will there be? There's going to be hospitals and all the other kind of thing, but is there always really going to be a church? The church is, the gospel is free, but the proclamation of it is not. And so we give our offering today to honor God, to recognize him as our Lord and Savior, but also to help perpetuate the church and the influence of the church that we all want in our community, but sometimes fail to realize what it takes to have it. So, as we receive our offering this morning, if the stewards will come forward, think about these things. Think about, what if we were in a community, community with no church? What would it be like? Thank you, sir. Father, for allowing us to have the privilege of sharing in the work of the Lord, that the gospel might be spread to the uttermost parts of the earth, and that it might be spread right here in our own community. Thank you, Father. Bless the gift and the giver. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. It's children's time. Would anyone like to join me? Hi. How are you today? Almost awake? Okay, all right. Um, oh, Haven's going to join us. Thank you, Haven. You have a companion. <laughs> all right. Did anybody look at the bulletin this morning? Did you read any of it? No, Haven did. Did you notice at the top with the date anything extra? Did you see anything written there? You didn't look there. Okay. Well, the top of your bulletin says that today is Grandparents' Day. So says the Hallmark Company. That's a card company. No. It is, it is um, uh, you know, we have all kinds of special days now. Hot dog day, ice cream day. Every day has got a, a special purpose. Well, today is Grandparents' Day. The second Sunday in September, annually, we recognize grandparents. Why would we want to recognize grandparents? What's so special about grandparents? We wouldn't be here if they weren't. Good point. Very good point. Do you know anything special about grandparents? No? 
You can't think of one special thing about grandma? Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. They have good food. Yes, they have good food. Doesn't um, Grandma Gail, Elena, tell me one nice thing about Grandma? Um, she, listens she listens to you. She has a, always time to listen to you. That's pretty special. Yeah. Okay. So I was thinking maybe you guys could help me recognize some grandparents. Would you be willing to do that? Okay. Is there anybody in the congregation that would like to share something special about your grandparent? Anybody? Oh, one of, yes, Bob. Your grandmother taught you how to read. I have heard that story. Bob struggled reading, and in the summers, he went to Grandma's house, and he got reading tutoring. Okay? She was a first grade teacher for a lot of years. One of my favorite memories with my grandparents, I grew up next door to Grandma and Grandpa. Do any of you live close to Grandma and Grandpa? Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, I could go to Grandma's house anytime, as many times a day as I wanted to. Yeah, walk over there. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, I walked over all the time. Mom knew if she couldn't find me, I was at Grandma's. Surprisingly, one of my favorite memories is helping my grandmother hang the laundry out on the clothesline. Did you ever do that? Did you help? Oh, it's so much fun. The clothespins and moving the basket so Grandma could put them up on the line. But the best part is when you take them down. Oh, they smell so good. And you take them inside and you fold them. But you can't just throw them in the basket. You kind of got to be neat about it before you go inside. So I learned how to hang clothes on the line with my grandma. And it was a fun job. I loved it. Okay. You're going to have more fun handing stuff out. Okay, let's stand up. Okay, let's see if we can. You can stand up too. All right. There aren't a lot of grandkids here today. You're here with a grandma, aren't you? <gasps> Anybody else have a grandchild here with them today? Hmm. Oh, guess what? That means Grandma gets a prize. Okay, you want to help deliver prizes? Okay. Grandma gets a prize. How about you take Grandma? It's for Grandma. If Grandma says it's okay. I did get a big enough box. She could share. Star, congratulations for having a grandchild here with you this morning. Okay. Yay. All right. So now, uh-oh, oh, cameraman. <laughs> um, all right. Now, let's see. Oh, how many grandparents do we have in the room? Oh, there's quite a few of you. Okay, quite a few. All right. Who, who has more than 10 grandchildren? Mary does. Andy, you have more than 10? You think so? Last time you counted? <laughs> okay, more than 12. Mary's hand is still up. Did we lose you at 10? Okay, anybody? Mary, how many grandchildren? 16? 15. 15. That's pretty cool, isn't it? 15. So can we give Mary a prize? Would you like to deliver Mary a prize? Okay. Hold on here. Let's see. Take this one to Mary, please. Oh. <laughs> She's checking out the box. Okay. So congratulations, Mary, for having the most grandchildren. Okay, who, who's the newest grandparent in the room? Who has a very young grandchild? What? <laughs> when one on the way? Yes. Woohoo! That's pretty young. Okay. She can get another one. Ah, uh, maybe. You would eat that one? <laughs> Take it to Grandma. 
Who has the oldest grandchild? Who's got a grandchild that is over 20? John does. Oh, Charlene does. Ron does. Over 30? A grandchild over 30? Charlene, you've got a grandchild over 30? 39. Woohoo! Is that old? Is 39 old? Okay, you think we better give Charlene a prize? Okay. What? Mary has 141. You guys are just chosen for cookies. Is Char who else? Linda? She beat you? Oh, okay. All right. All right. What did I... I got a couple more cookies. Let's see. Oh, get a daddy hug. All right. Who drove the farthest this morning to church? That's a grandparent. Anybody drive farther than five miles to come to church this morning and you are a grandparent? <gasps> Mr. Livengood did. Okay, how far did you drive, Mr. Livengood? From Lebanon. From Lebanon. Okay, all right. Any, okay, do we think that Lebanon maybe is the farthest drive this morning? Perhaps to come to church? No one's fighting you for it, Mr. Livengood. Okay, would you please give this to Mr. Livengood? Congratulations, Grandpa. We got a grandpa in there. Woohoo! Okay. Can you stand up with me? All right. Can we all be in agreement that grandparents are one of God's wonderful blessings? Yes. Grandma's a blessing, isn't she? Okay. Yes. I think grandparents are a wonderful blessing. And many of you have grandparents who bring you to church. So remember, grandmas and grandpas, you are a wonderful Christian influence in your grandchild's life. In some instances, maybe the only one willing to bring them to church. Sometimes it's hard to drag mom and dad along. So remember that you play a valuable role in the family. And we thank you for that. Okay, let's say prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for grandparents. Help us to remember to give them hugs and let them know how much we love them and appreciate them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Girls, thank you so much for your help. Got it? All right. the Abundant Life series of sermons, we ask three important questions. What am I? Who am I? And why am I in this world? We dealt with the first two questions in the Abundant Life series of sermons. And I said we de would deal with the last question in the next series of sermons. The question, why am I in this world? Today we begin a series of sermons that we entitled, Living the Purposeful Life. Today's sermon is entitled, Don't Waste Your Life. Let's pray before we jump into this subject. Father, we respect you and we honor your word. We thank you that you've made your word so free, freely available to us. As we study the truths in your word, help us, Father, to assimilate them into our lives and see them in our action. Thank you, Father, for your teaching. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gospel singer Michael W. Smith ach achieved almost overnight recognition in the secular music world with his song, My Place in This World. In this song, he sings about trying desperately to find my place in this world. Michael W. Smith's song connected with people uh, who are struggling with this basic question. What in the world am I doing here? What's my purpose in life? 
And these people may be doing a lot in life, but they, they feel that what they're doing, it's not amount to much. It's, it's not a new question. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, wrote about the subject of feeling empty and unfulfilled and insignificant. 27 times in the book uh, of Ecclesiastes, he uses the word vanity to describe all of our useless efforts to make ourselves happy or significant in life. And he wraps up his journal on the futility of busy lives by saying that unless a person is committed to fulfill what God wants him to do, all efforts for happiness and for f fulfillment in this world are futile. And so the question posed by this series I think is very relevant and very timely. What on earth am I here for? How do you prevent wasting your life? Let's look at our text, which is the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul addresses this question in verses 15 through 17. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Note that word there, it said, be very careful. The opposite of careful is careless. The Greek word in this passage literally means don't stumble through life. Don't just drift through life. Think it through. Know why you're here. Know your purpose in life. And then make the most of every opportunity that you have. Be wise. Understand what God wants you to do. If, if I were to ask you, would you really like to know what God wants you to do with your life? I'm sure everybody would say, oh yeah, sure, I want to know, tell me. Many years ago, a minister in Denver, Colorado, by the name of Charles Blair, pastor of Calvary Temple in Denver, hired an independent secular polling company to conduct a poll among more than 5,000 people in the city of Denver and in the shopping malls in the outlying suburbs. And the question that the pollsters asked every person was this, what topics do you want to hear preached in your church? And these answers were then compiled in the order of the frequency of the, of the request. And they chose the 10 most frequently asked responses to this question. And Pastor Blair began preaching a series of sermons on each of these subjects. And he preached a series of 10 sermons, and these were later put into a book entitled, The Silent Thousands Suddenly Speak Out. What do you think was the most requested sermon of all, of over 5,000 people? Any, any guesses? It's okay to talk in church. By far the most requested sermon was this. How to know God's will for my life. People who attend Salem Methodist Church and the people you invite most often wonder, what God wants them to do with their lives. Well, what, are we, what are we here for? And so what we want to do in this series of sermons is to look at the purposes that God has created us to fulfill. We're going to begin today to prepare our hearts for this journey into discovering or rediscovering maybe God's purposes by considering three important questions in life. What does God want? What does it take? And why should I? First of all, what does God want from my life? To summarize it in a few words, He wants my whole life. Not 10%, not 50%, not 99%. He wants all of me. 
This is emphasized in the book of Romans, where Paul wrote to the church in the city of Rome, the Roman letter. In the city, in the Romans 6, chapter 13, chapter 6, verse 13, this is what Paul wrote. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. All of me. That's what he wants. Now, now bear with me. <laughs> Only just for illustration. Let's suppose that you were arrested for committing a crime, some felony that you've committed, and you've been sentenced to prison for a certain length of time. Now, how much of you is put in prison? Half of you? Three quarters? A, 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 an arm and a leg? An ear and a, no, a, a, a nostril? How, how much of you is put in the prison? Well, you say, Jim, that's ridiculous. And you're right, it is. All of you, when you are sentenced to prison, all of you goes to prison. C.S. Lewis once said, the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. If Christianity is really true, then it deserves everything you've got. If it's not true, you shouldn't even be here at all. It's either true, and that should determine the rest of your life, or you should just chuck it and go do whatever you want to do. There are still a lot of people trying to sit on the fence, and that can be very uncomfortable on the seat after a while. People say, oh, I just don't know what God wants me to do. And God says in both the Old and the New Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. A lot of people say, I'll serve God in my spare time. People think that their spiritual life is one part of the pie. Imagine a big pie up here divided into slices. And there's work, and there's family, and there's recreation, and there's church. That's not how God sees it at all. That's wrong. God is the whole pie. He wants you under his total control. He wants you total being. There's a popular myth that says you can have it all. You can do it all. But you can't. You have to give it all to God. In the book, in the Gospel of Matthew, we have a rather, I think, rather interesting statement. Matthew chapter 6. And the last verse it's, it is... Uh, Verse 24, it says this. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's talking about, uh, talking about God and or money. Which one is our master? Doesn't say, that verse I just read, doesn't say you should not. He says you cannot. It's impossible. It is impossible to have two number one priorities in your life. You're always going to have a number one. Everything else is going to be numbers two, three, four, five, and so on. And this verse is talking about trying to seek after God and money at the same time. But there are, there are a lot of other things that can push God out of first place in your life. Play, sports, hobbies, friends, school, schoolwork, dating, even your own family. God is trying to tell us that you cannot serve God and something else at the same time. You can serve God with these other things or through these other things. That's okay. But God says, I want to be totally in charge of your life. 
And so the question gets to be, who's going to be first place in your life? Building your career, raising your family, saving for retirement, maintaining your good health. All of these things are good. I mean, God created all of them and God approves of them all. Except just not in first place in your life. God says, you will have no other gods before me. And whatever is in first place in your life is your God, small g. That's called an idol. And God says that's wrong. Do you remember this scripture? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. God says, make me number one in your life before everything else and then I'll bring it all back into focus in the right way, whatever it is. God says, I'll put it all together for you. An actual incident in the life of Jesus illustrates this. Jesus was walking down the streets of Jerusalem one day, and a man walked up to Jesus, and Jesus said, follow me. And the guy said, okay, I will follow you, but Lord, let me first Go and take care of some things I've got to take care of. And folk, that little phrase, Lord, let me first, it's a contradiction. You see, you can't say Lord and me first at the same time. If you're saying me first, he's not your Lord. So you've got to decide who's going to be the Lord in your life. Where, where are you saying? I have, I've asked myself this question. What, where, where am I saying to God, me first? Where am I saying, let me first find someone to marry? Let me first finish my schooling. Let me first get the kids out of school. Let me first get the kids out of the house. Let me first achieve financial independence. Let me first pay off my mortgage. Let me first build my career. Let me first finance my kid's college education. And God says, if I'm not first, this is going to be in the right order or have the right perspective. In Luke 14 is the story of the king who planned a, to give a big banquet and he invited everyone to come. And in that scripture it says, but they all alike began to make excuses. These three guys were invited to the banquet by the king, and they all turn him down. The first guy uses his wealth. Land. I got to go, bought some land. I got to inspect it. The land will still be there. The second guy uses his work. And the third guy makes... <laughs> may come the closest to having a real excuse. He said, I got a wife and I got to go with her. We all need to honestly ask and answer the question, what excuses do we keep giving to God for putting ourselves first? If we could just learn that if we put God first in our lives, he'll take care of everything else. Proverbs 3 in the Living Bible says, in everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. If you want to be a success, the Bible tells you how. Put God first. What does God want? He wants all of you. Number two, what does it take to give God what he wants? It takes discipline. Proverbs 10 says, He who heeds discipline is on the way to life. You cannot be a disciple without discipline. The two words go together. 1 Timothy 4 says, Train, discipline yourself to be godly. What is discipline? Well, delayed gratification. 
It's doing the difficult now in order to enjoy the benefit later. Many of you are, no doubt, already incredibly disciplined. I mean, you're disciplined in your work. You plan your day, you're always on time, you're conscientious in your work. You're disciplined in your physical workouts. You never miss a physical workout. Many of you never miss a favorite TV show. You never miss a meal. Yes, many of you are very disciplined in some areas. And I can tell each of you exactly in which areas you are disciplined. Because it's true for all of us, me included. We are disciplined in the areas we want to be. We are disciplined in the things that we get done. The things that are important to us, they get done. What, what if you were as disciplined in having a quiet time with God in prayer and Bible study as you are in never missing a meal? Suppose you were as disciplined in serving others as you are in getting up and going to work every day. Suppose you were as disciplined in attending church as you are in watching that favorite TV show that you never miss. There's another word for discipline. It's called habits. Habits are disciplines. And you, you're the sum total of your habits. Tell me what you habitually do and I will tell you what your character is. If you habitually tell, tell the truth, you have integrity. If you are habitually faithful to your spouse, you're a faithful person. If it's what you do consistently without thinking or having to decide whether or not you're going to do something that depend, determines the kind of person you are. Your character, your whole life is designed, shaped, controlled, and developed by the disciplines of, or the habits of your life. So if you want to change your life, all you got to do is change your habits. Sound easy, doesn't it? One of the major goals of this sermon series is to help you and me to develop some new spiritual habits. 1 Timothy 4 says, the latter part of the verse, train yourself to be godly. Let me suggest two exercises you can do to keep yourself spiritually fit. Let me introduce this by reading to you Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, and some versions say every weight that hinders us, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perfection and perfer perseverance the race marked out for us. We throw off everything that hinders us, every weight that hinders us. That's an important word. And the sin. These are two things that limit our potential in life to fulfill God's purposes. The writer of Hebrews says, we've got to let go of these things. Now, we know what sins are. They're, they're breaking God's commandments. But what is a weight, as the English version says, or the, the everything that the NIV says? What are, what are these weights? Something that is not, it's not necessarily wrong. It's just unnecessary. A weight can be all kinds of things. A relationship, an expectation, an activity, a club, a memory that you refuse to let go, a fear, a job. There are a hundred thousand weights or more. And the Bible says that in order to grow and reach our potential to fulfill God's purposes for us in our life, we must learn to say no to some things that are not bad. In fact, they may be quite good. I must learn to say no to things. Things, not sin, good stuff I'm talking about. But you say no because you can't do it all. You can't have it all. 
One reason we have a hard time letting go of some activities is because we tie our identity to these things. But if we're really serious about fulfilling God's purposes for us in this life, we're going to have to make space for God in our lives by cutting some good stuff out. We are completely clock bound. I mean, we get up, we shave, we eat breakfast, we dash out and jump in the car, and we rush to work by the clock and the rear view mirror. And then we get to work and we punch the clock, and I don't blame a guy, I'd punch the thing too. We work by the clock till coffee break time, and then we go out to get Cokes, nicotine, caffeine, and then we prop ourselves up so we can get through to the noon hour. We watch the clock until noon, and then we rush about for 30, 45 minutes, an hour. And then we watch the clock again until time to go home. And then we get in the car, we drive home by the clock and the rear view mirror. And then we rush in, eat dinner, maybe change clothes, rush out again, and run around all around the earth trying to find some way to get peace and satisfaction in our lives still racing by the clock. And then we come home and set the alarm clock. We sleep by the clock, waking up every 5, 10, 15 times a night to be sure we haven't overslept and missed the clock. And then we get up and start the whole thing over again. And then we come to church and we sing, Take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. It's high time we Christian people do more than just sing about being holy. It's high time we take the time to be holy. And to do that, we have to make room in our lives. I'm concerned because many people can't keep adding to their lives things that are already way too overcrowded. You can put so many irons in the fire that you put out the fire. If you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. Not everything in your life is of equal value. Anytime you take on a new activity in your calendar, you ought to ask, what am I not going to do at the same time. I want you to know people, I'm preaching to myself. You may have to give up an hour of TV. You can go home and watch reruns of Friends, or you can go out and find a group and make friends. Maybe you need to cut back on your physical workout and give some attention to your spiritual workout. Because one day, no matter how well you take care of it, one day your body is going to decay and you're, you're going to not be using it anymore. But your spirit, your soul, is going to live forever. There's always the, a cost to putting God first in your life, but the rewards are worth it. Another exercise you can do is the discipline of putting first things first. Jesus, Jesus had come to visit at the home of Mary and Martha. Martha was easily distracted by her many tasks. She had spiritual ADD. Can you identify with that? But Jesus said, only one thing is really needed, and Mary had chosen to do that which was most needed. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning from Jesus. You see, not every task is of equal value. At that time, it was to, spread, to spend time with Jesus. If it comes down to washing the dishes, or getting the house ready, fixing the meal, or spending time with Jesus, that ought to be a no-brainer. Do you find yourself like Martha? I do. I find myself like uh, tasks 
tasks on my to-do list distract from focusing on God. They do for me. We will live an average of 25,550 days on this earth. Don't you think it would be smart to spend some of those days to figure out what you ought to do with the rest of those days? Luke says Mary chose the better of the two choices. You say, I can't get it all done. Of course you can't. But it's not all worth doing. No one's holding a gun to your head saying you have to do it all. A lot of things are self-imposed, not mandatory. You just do them out of expectation. Someone or yourself expects you to do them. You have the time to grow spiritually. You just have to choose to make the time. I want you to know, I'm preaching to myself here. Romans, Psalm 39 says, All our busy rushing ends in nothing. Proverbs 10 in the Living Bible says, Reverence for God adds hours to each day. Did you get that? Reverence for God adds hours to each day. You want more hours in a day? There's how to do it. It's a little bit like tithing. People who tithe with the proper motivation, they attest that nine-tenths with God goes farther than ten-tenths without God. They can't logically, mathematically explain how that works, but they've experienced that it does work. And it's the same thing with our time. You see, we choose whether or not we trust God with our tithe and our time. What does God want? All of you. Every part. What does it take to grow spiritually? Discipline. You can't be a disciple without discipline. And number three, why should I do it? Why should I make the time and the effort to grow spiritually? There are many, many benefits. Now and forever in eternity. But even if there were no benefit, even if there were none at all, I can tell you and I can think in, uh, of uh, one reason why you ought to do it. And I can tell you what it is in two words. The cross. Jesus gave his life completely for you and me. And we can have with him eternal life in heaven. And it's going to cost you to live for him. But he deserves it. Because if it were not for the cross you would have no destiny in which to place your hope. But because of the cross, you will live forever with God and Christ and your loved ones in heaven who are Christ's followers. We literally owe Christ our lives. The eternal destiny of people matters to God. It's far more important than anything you or I may have to do on our to-do list. God cares about your eternal destiny. He cares about the eternal destiny of your family, your neighbors, your community, your friends, your co-workers, people you're in school with, people you work with. Second Corinthians 6 says, We beg you, Please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. Isn't that good? First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given you. As the poet said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Nothing else, nothing else is going to matter. Let's pray.
Thank you, God, for sending your Son to be our Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us. Thank you for letting me and this congregation be a part of what you're going to do here in this sermon series. In your name we pray. Amen. Please turn to hymn number, I think it's 368. My hope is built on nothing less. And let's stand and sing all verses of this hymn. kids were little they always sang that song all of the ground is stinking stinking sand that's not too far from the truth either now as as we leave this sanctuary of God's peace and prepare to enter our mission field I want us to take this scripture from the Apostle Paul writing to the Philippian Christians take it with you and refer to it throughout the week. Chapter 4 of Philippians and beginning with verse 12, Paul wrote this for us. I have learned to be content in with whatever circumstances I find myself in. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. God will go with you. He will give you strength to live for him. God bless you. Thanks for being here. See you next Sunday. Mm -hmm.